Namaste, I am Anita Goa. Welcome to my channel. So should you or shouldn't you do inversions during your period? I've always wondered about this myself. So today we are lucky we are going to get an answer. And the answer is coming via Mary Flaherty, who is the author of this book, Does Yoga Work? Answers from Science. I hope you enjoy the interview. Unfortunately, the quality of the video isn't super great. The audio is okay, and I know that you can use your yogic concentration, dharana, to get you through this one. It is going to be well worth it and really support you on your continued journey with yoga and whether to do inversions or not. All of the information about Mary and myself will be in the description box below. Enjoy. This is one thing that I was very interested in when I was reading your book. So could you elaborate a little bit more on specifically this uh, question? Because I think that there are so many yoga teachers and yoga practitioners who are wondering about this. Should I or shouldn't I? Should I or shouldn't I? Um, yeah, like yourself, I was told over and over again when I was training, you know, it's, it's kind of it, most of the traditions that I've worked in, I've always been led to believe that you don't invert during a period. So again, I was really interested when I read through the research and lots has been done on this. I'll, I'll, I'll start to answer a question from um, the point of view of the yoga traditions. The yoga traditions usually tell us that we can't go upside down while we're menstruating because, first of all, the apana energy is going to be brought down, and that's against the natural flow of the energy system in our bodies. The second and sort of semi-scientific research that's usually given is that if we go upside down when we're menstruating, the flow of our period will will flow away from our vagina and it might go into the fallopian tubes, which can increase the risk of retrograde um, uh, menstruation, which can then cause endometriosis. So that's the kind of more scientific reason that's usually given. The first is the apana being disturbed. Now, from the scientific point of view, I can say that we don't have the tools to study apana and prana. We can't study these things. So there's no evidence because we don't have the tools, I can't say that there's just we, science doesn't have the tools to study the uh, pana. So I, we can make no comment on that from a scientific viewpoint. But the second reason um, is there's no evidence. First of all, um, endometriosis is um, is no, there's no evidence to show that it's caused by retrograde menstruation. Uh, Ninety percent of women who are menstruating will suffer. Well, I, I won't say suffer. They will encounter retrograde menstruation, and they won't even notice it. But only ten percent of women have uh, endometriosis, so it, that doesn't add up. Um, and finally, um, a lot of work has been done on female astronauts, and when they're out in space, and gravity is throwing them around like a washing machine for months, for years on end, uh, it, it doesn't have any negative effect on their 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 uh, circadian rhythm of their natural um, menstruation cycle. So even though gravity is taking them in all directions, it doesn't affect the, um, the, the cycle, it doesn't affect their health in any way at all. So from um, the scientific point of view, there is no evidence at all to say that going upside down during your period is harmful, none at all. Um, there is evidence to say that doing yoga, and that's the whole gamut, including going upside down, um, is good for you throughout the month, including during the menstruation, that it can reduce pain and increases quality of life and so on. But I would put that gamut there, that as far as the apana going in the opposite direction from which it should be, uh, that's an area that we don't know about from a scientific viewpoint. So perhaps that is an area that should be, you know, we, we need to respect and um, take that into account in making those kind of decisions. Yeah, great, great. Thank you for elaborating on that. Now, I'm just wondering, because 
I've always heard, like I come from the Ashtanga background. I no longer practice Ashtanga, but that's how I started. And I've always heard these stories of women who practice real intense Ashtanga. And you know, Ashtanga is very intense and very rigorous and you have to practice six days a week and you only take off on new moon and full moon, that it has impacted their, their period like thrown it off, some have lost a period for a, a period of time, uh, no pun intended, uh, or pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, when you say that, <laughs> so when you say that uh, research says to practice yoga consistently throughout the month, what does the research say about what kind of yoga? Because to me, it doesn't necessarily mean strong active yoga constantly. To me, it means vary the yoga and have the restorative and yin and uh, both lunar and solar practices. But does the research talk anything about that? Yeah. Um, it doesn't talk specifically about uh, what you're saying, but uh, many of the studies compared yoga with exercise as well you know, aerobic exercise on various issues. So, for example, on the ones about doing um, yoga throughout the month, they also did aerobic exercise throughout the month. So they compared them, and they were equally beneficial. Um, what I have read again and again, and coming to your point, because I think it's really important for practitioners and teachers to know, is that yoga, its, it's, it's unique aspect is that it's non-competitive, either with others or ourselves. And um, I think setting up a kind of, not that I'm throwing goals out the door, but setting up goalposts like we do perhaps in running a marathon or whatever in the exercise sort of world is something that is really foreign to yoga as it's as it was originally. It was a, it was a, a platform for transformation. Um, in our modern world, it can often be very competitive, where we're competing perhaps against ourselves or others. Um, and the, the research shows that a consistent um, practice is the, the real secret. Not consistently hard, not consistently strong, a consistent practice and where we know our bodies and we keep in touch with them. So if we're tired, then it's more a yin practice. If we are, um, maybe a pranayama practice is going to be just perfect when we're, our energy is low and we can use the breathing. So the, the take-home message, and I wouldn't say there's any specific study on this, it's more my own sort of uh, bird's eye view of all the research that I've read, is that it's more how you do it than what you do. And the, the um, increasing one's relationship improving one's relationship with one's body and oneself, one's mind, is one of the best um, uh, benefits of yoga. And as a result of in improving that relationship, we go away from the cognitive and more to the visceral. So if we're feeling, for example, maybe ashtanga like six days a week and da 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 da, maybe, you know, it's a change of season, it's a change in our lives, things are going on. We need to adjust and we need to be able to tune into that subtle change. And that can be difficult because it involves a level of intuition, which is, um, is uh, in our modern world, we tend to go more cognitive uh, and intuition is probably the better pathway in, in that situation.